don't say anything. All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Let's begin today's uh, event entitled Climate Change in a Growing Urbanizing World, Understanding the Demography of Adaptation. My name is Sandeep Bathala. I am the Senior Program Associate with the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. The Environmental Change and Security Program, ECSP, is 19 years old, and we look at the various connections between health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security. Today's event is brought to you by our HELPS project, which incidentally stands for the words I just used, health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security. And our HELPS project is generously supported by USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. As many of you probably know, the Wilson Center is a formal memorial to our 28th president, the only president thus far to have achieved a PhD. And in his honor, we aim to bring the worlds of policy, practice, and academia uh, together to better inform one another. You have the bios in front of you, so I want to direct your attention now to our moderator, Kathleen Mogelgaard, who's an independent consultant that works with us here at ECSP. She's going to go ahead and introduce the rest of our speakers to you, but I did want to make a note about today's event. We are webcasting live, so when we come to the discussion, I'd ask that you use a mic, and my colleagues will be in the room um, passing one around, and I'd ask that you introduce yourself and your affiliation. Kathleen will share more information about this uh, in a moment, but we have an exciting opportunity today where we have some guests tuning in live from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and for anybody who's either in Tennessee or tuning in in general to our webcast, if you have any questions, feel free to um, direct them to our Twitter, and we are using the hashtag adaptation today. So thank you. I'll turn it over to Kathleen. Thank you very much, Sandeep, and welcome, everyone. My name is Kathleen Mogelgaard, and I'm a consultant with the Wilson Center, and I'm really happy to welcome you all here today. I, I'm pleased to see such a good crowd in the room. I know our ranks are probably a little bit thinner than they might otherwise have been because a number of our colleagues in the federal government are unable to come to work today. Uh, but we are very pleased to announce that this event is being webcast, as Sandeep mentioned, and the video of the event will be available on the Wilson Center's website for any of our colleagues who weren't able to be here today and who want to watch this event at a later date. Um, as Sandeep mentioned, this event is being webcast live, and today we do have a special audience watching us from Chattanooga, Tennessee where the Society of Environmental Journalists is holding its annual conference. My Environmental Change and Security Program colleagues are hosting a special day-long workshop there entitled From Chattanooga to Chennai, Reporting on Population and Sustainability in an Urbanizing World. And they are with a group of journalists from the United States, from Africa, and from Asia. So welcome to our guests in Tennessee and to our guests here in DC. Um, and we're looking forward to having some input from our guests in Tennessee via Twitter when we get to the question and answer part of our program. Um, we're really pleased to be hosting the DC launch of a new book, The Demography of Adaptation to Climate Change. And we're especially pleased to have the book's co-editor and two chapter contributors with us here today. Uh, the foreword to this book, which was published by the United Nations Population Fund earlier this year, talks about how adaptation to climate change is not just about acting or reacting to the impacts of climate change. It's about planning, it's about development, and about preparing for the world as it will be, not just as it is. And of course, population dynamics play a central role in livelihoods, in economic vulnerability, environmental vulnerability, and resilience. Understanding population dynamics is critical in avoiding static perceptions of vulnerability. Changes that affect the size, distribution, and composition of human populations also affect both the nature of vulnerability and adjustments in natural or human systems in response to climate change. This book addresses a gap in adaptation efforts to date by pointing to the vital role that an understanding of population dynamics and the use of demographic data can have in developing proactive and effective adaptation policies and practices. 
I've just returned from a Wilson Center and USAID workshop in the Dominican Republic that focused on climate change and adaptation among vulnerable populations in the Dominican Republic. And certainly population dynamics uh, was a topic that was really central in the discussion in that workshop last week in the DR. Um, urbanization is a, is a dominant trend in the Dominican Republic with about 60% of the population there now living in urban areas. That is projected to grow to over 75% of the population there. Um, and certainly a lot of that urban growth is happening in unplanned settlements um, and really contributes to the vulnerability of the Dominican people to the kinds of climate change impacts that they are already beginning to experience and that will worsen in decades to come. So the folks who are participating in that workshop last week were from national government agencies, from local government, from academia, and from NGOs that are working with vulnerable populations. And they were really interested in trying to explore how those changing demographic dynamics in the Dominican Republic relate to vulnerability of society there and how they can structure adaptation plans that will be most effective and responsive to those kinds of changes. Um, these are the kinds of issues that we'll be exploring with our speakers today. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, and just a quick introduction to our three speakers. Um, we'll start with Daniel Schensel, who is a technical specialist with the Population and Development Branch of the Technical Division at the United Nations Population Fund. And there he works on climate change, urbanization, and data analysis and dissemination. He is a co-editor of the book that we are launching here in DC today, The Demography of Adaptation to Climate Change. And he also co-edited the 2009 book, Population Dynamics and Climate Change. Uh, Daniel has worked extensively on climate change adaptation with a particular focus on the data foundations of vulnerability assessment and the spatial distribution of vulnerability in a wide range of contexts, including in Malawi and Indonesia. He received his PhD in sociology from Brown University with a concentration on urban development and spatial analysis. Our second speaker will be Jose Miguel Guzman, who has worked since June 2013 for ICF International here in Maryland as regional coordinator of the demographic and health surveys. There he is responsible for the surveys in Francophone countries and in Latin America. Previously, he was the chief of the population and development branch of the United Nations Population Fund. And in that job, he coordinated work in the area of population and climate change, among other areas. He co-edited the 2009 book, Population Dynamics and Climate Change, and was the coordinator of and contributor to the book that we're launching here in DC today, The Demography of Adaptation to Climate Change. He has published research on population and development issues, including aging, fertility transition, urbanization, and other topics. And Jose Miguel has a PhD in demography from the University of Montreal. Our third and final speaker will be Sainan Zhang, who is a consultant with the United Nations Population Fund. Her work focuses on spatial analysis, population vulnerability, and climate change. She received her PhD in sustainability from Arizona State University, and her PhD research concentrated on sustainable ur urban development, especially the interlinked issues of human and environment dynamics. She obtained her MSc in Urban Environmental Management in the Netherlands and a Bachelor of Architecture in China. Sainan has worked with the government and NGOs in China on UN and European Commission funded projects. And over career, she has conducted interdisciplinary research broadly relating to population, land use, environmental impacts, and urban sustainability. I'm really pleased to welcome these three speakers here today. Uh, the structure for our uh, session today, Daniel will start with an overview of the importance of population dynamics for adaptation. He'll be followed by Jose Miguel, who will share perspectives on ways to think about measuring vulnerability in light of available population and census data. And then Shainan will close for us by demonstrating the application of these approaches for urban vulnerability and adaptation in Malawi and Indonesia. Uh, this will include an interactive component and will allow for us to explore population characteristics, housing, and infrastructure 
in climate exposed areas using GIS maps. So you'll definitely want to stick around for that interactive component. Uh, we'll have uh, short presentations from each of the three speakers, and then we will open it up to uh, questions and answers and discussion with all of you. So uh, it's a really exciting program today. Again, I thank all of you for being here. I want to thank our speakers, and I'll turn it over to Daniel. Well, thank you, Kathleen, for that uh, excellent introduction and also uh, for continuing to you know, be interested in this work, to be a part of this work, and uh, to have had the idea for, I think, this event uh, with, uh, also I'd like to thank Sandeep and the Wilson Center uh, in general, which has uh, consistently supported us. This is my second time here. Uh, participating in such an event and uh, we're really excited to share this work with you with the Wilson Center and with uh, in particular the, uh, in addition the colleagues uh, who are joining in at the Society for Environmental Journalism. Um, I think this is an enormous opportunity. I think we all understand the complexities of communication around climate change and this work is uh, we hope will contribute to that by making data accessible and by making uh, population change really understandable. Um, so I'd like to start, um, we're gonna, the book covers a broad range of issues and we're gonna focus this particular session on uh, urbanization. Uh, and so the book has really been a, a pleasure to produce. It was a collaborative effort of UNFPA, the International Institute for Environment and Development and El Colegio de Mexico. Uh, so I'd like to also thank them. They could not be here to present, uh, but it's an honor to present on their behalf. And last, I'd really like to use this opportunity to thank Jose Miguel, who uh, betrayed us terribly by leaving recently, <laughs> um, but is a true champion of the cause of climate change generally and the importance of uh, bringing a population and social perspective to climate change actions around the world. Uh, four years ago, five years ago, when we started this work, this, it, it didn't exist. And it was through Jose Miguel's leadership and championing of this issue and pushing and fighting that it became uh, the work platform that it is today. So thank you, Jose Miguel. So let's get started. Um, the sh I so the today's talk, today's sets of talks will go through each part of the book. My part will be the first part, which is the conceptual framework to understand the links between population dynamics and climate change. I'll particularly be building on uh, the first three chapters of the book. Uh, the framework paper, uh, chapter one, uh, written by myself and David Dodman. Uh, a, an urbanization-focused chapter uh, written by Gordon McGranahan of IIED, along with a number of uh, very prominent colleagues and uh, a, the migration chapter uh, written by Cecilia Tacoli, also of IIED. And part, part two of the book is a methodological and data-oriented discussion of how to put in place the, concept in, uh, the concepts laid out in part one. Uh, Jose Miguel will address that. And then part three is, let's see this in action. And that's where we have this exciting opportunity to really delve deep into the data with Sainan. So what are we going to be discussing today? Well, the central argument here is about the importance of, of bringing a population perspective into climate change vulnerability assessments and into adaptation planning. The, the discussion around adaptation, which got a bit of a late start uh, in climate change response, continues even now to be oriented to what rather than who. Uh, to the physical environment and uh, vulnerabilities and impacts therein uh, without necessarily always the recognition at the end what we are trying to achieve is uh, resilience, security, well-being for people. Uh, and the population perspective really I think can bring that. Um, and then the way forward, how to turn this agenda into something actionable. So I'd like to start with a bit of a retrospective. Some of you may recognize this from the fourth assessment report. It's sort of a conceptual framework 
for climate change, both mitigation and adaptation, drivers and impacts. And, um, you know, if we look closely, we see a little bit of population. There's a little bit, that it, certainly it's part of the modeling of uh, emissions uh, in terms of global overall number. Um, and then also we see settlements, which is sort of intergovernmental code for urban, uh, along with society. But, uh, and as we delve a bit deeper into the report, it's, it's not very strong. And in particular, you know, where do we see, we see settlements, but where do we see urbanization? Where do we see the fact that people are continually and constantly moving? That over the, the uh, unfolding of climate change in the last, you know, decades, households have changed enormously, the location uh, and composition of them, and indeed the social aspects of vulnerability. And as we look at what's available so far from AR5, the fifth assessment report that's just in the process of being released. So again, we have the population incorporated into emissions projections. Um, we have population fit into the human health, well-being, and security components. There's a bit of migration in the rural areas chapter, but generally there's this emphasis on, on marginalized populations. Very valuable, very important, but this is a perspective about certain marginalized groups in society, not about the overall composition, structure, and location of, pop of population. There are, this is a big advance uh, following a big gap Previously, there are two chapters on cities, one on mitigation and one on adaptation. Um, but again, taking a more physical ecosystems and built envir environment approach. So what is population dynamics? Well, here it is, the, the size distribution by age, spatial distribution including urbanization, density, composition of households and family, and the variables that generate these results fertility, mortality, migration, and family formation. And this is what we're trying to bring to the table. So why is this so important? Well, first of all, uh, vulnerability and adaptation is highly dynamic. It's not, a, it's not a static concept, as Kathleen was mentioning. It's not a moment in time. It's constantly in flux. And when we think particularly about urban areas, the sort of um, one of, as an urban development person, our kind of foundational rule is cities are always changing constantly, from a population perspective, from a social perspective, from an economic perspective. So having a dynamic understanding of vulnerability, particularly in the context of, of cities, is critical. The second, and this uh, will also link, you'll see some of this come up again when Jose Miguel talks about uh, how we measure, is that there are um, different components of adaptation. The first is indirect, which is this recognition that climate change is so broad, it's so encompassing, it's short term, it's long term, it unfolds over decades, it impacts all kinds of different uh, locations, livelihoods, uh, social interactions, that you know, a targeted sort of disaster risk reduction or response is simply not sufficient, that we need overall development to generate adaptation and resilience. And as we think about that, particularly over the decades that will come, uh, population change will be enormous. So thinking particularly about urbanization, how the world adds 2.5 billion new urban residents in the coming decades is going to shape enormously the livelihoods, the well-being, the, the environmental security of those urban residents and indeed of our societies and economies uh, overall. And then the third piece is that there are direct relationships. I mean, to put it very simply, and this seems overly simple almost every time I present it, knowing the size, density, composition, and characteristics of the people in exposed areas is critical for finding ways to help them adapt. Um, and so I think we're going to talk a bit more about that. So I, I put up this, uh, this vulnerability definition just to say that there are three components of vulnerability that help understand why it's so dynamic. The first is exposure. Um, and this is, in, es in essence, are you in or out of, a, of, of an area that's liable to be impacted? Um, the second is sensitivity. Does the way society, how, how, uh, how the way society is constructed, uh, what extent of change will be caused by a given level of climate hazard? And the third is adaptive capacity. You know, humans are adaptable. We are not automatons, we, are, we don't just sort of react to events, but instead we adjust and we have a certain set of characteristics that we bring to that that allow us to do that. And that, we're going to concentrate on these dimensions. 
there, there's been a lot of work on city vulnerability uh, and resilience. So uh, there's a, uh, an assessment report on cities. The World Bank has done a, a number of different kinds of approaches, both methodological and, um, and uh, substantive for different case studies. Um, now, again, it's been a city focus, I would say. And what we want to try to do is, sh is shift emphasis a little bit to bring in an urbanization focus. Right? And this is, again, why do we want to do this? Who is most vulnerable? why and how to target policies for them, not just what is most vulnerable. So let's think about urbanization, not cities necessarily, but urbanization and climate vulnerability. And the first thing that emerges is, you know, one of the common things people think about climate migration is that there are going to be hundreds of millions maybe of, of people fleeing disaster in essence. But right now when we think about migration and climate change, it's reasonable to say that most people are moving towards vulnerability, not away from vulnerability. And that's because the calculus of migration is complicated. It's not about your environmental threats 10, 20, 30 years down the line. It's about your job and your well-being and your social networks and your family. And the fact is there are currently, well, 10 years ago, there were 360 million urban residents living in low elevation coastal zone cities. Uh, thriving cities are often located near the coast for historical reasons around shipping and uh, production. And coastal cities exert enormous draws on people uh, from a social and economic perspective. And so let's think about migration in that way. Let's think about current flows of people and how that impacts vulnerability. The second is inequality. Cities compress and contain and compact inequality. Uh, inequality is soared within country, within city even as certain countries have caught up with other countries. And what that means is that the way a ha climate hazard impacts society is highly differential. It matters whether you have resources to adapt. It matters whether you have uh, livelihoods, whether you have the ability to leave if necessary, whether you have the reason to think that you could return. Um, and so inequality matters. And of course, Sandy and Katrina, we're coming on the, the one year anniversary of Sandy that impacted many of us in New York in highly personal ways and very clearly demonstrated along with Katrina that what you bring to the table really shapes the way you can respond to events that may, uh, environmental disasters that may occur. And the third piece, and this is, I think I'd like to particularly speak to those journalists who are weighing in, there's a lot of attention to the mega cities. There's a lot of attention to the primary cities. I'm just going to throw up some data very quickly. Right now, uh, you know, almost 1.9 billion people live in cities fewer than 500,000. Uh, the majority of the population in the coming decades will continue to live in cities under a million people. So, and these cities are precisely those that don't necessarily have the enormous resources, the capacity uh, and the ability to engage with international partners uh, to conduct adaptation activities. So cover these cities, pay attention to the secondary and tertiary cities, um, and, and that will help. So, and, and the last piece here when we think about urbanization, what does it mean to govern for people who have not yet arrived? And what does it mean to govern for impacts climate impacts that have not yet arrived. And particularly, what does it mean to govern for both of those together in the context of electoral politics that have a much shorter time frame? So when we think about exposure, rather than just asking where the locations uh, are that are dangerous, let's let ask who lives or works in these locations. Who lives, who, who lives or works in locations that lack infrastructure? Whose homes and neighborhoods face the greatest risk, right? So I look here, I, I like to show this picture. This is a picture where we see lots of, th several different kinds of risk coming together. We have a low-income settlement in the Philippines. We have a coastal settlement. We have a seawall that's crumbling. We have a lack of uh, electricity uh, and other kinds of services. Um, and so this creates a, a, a multiple dimensions of exposure that need to be addressed. And we also need to look at adaptive capacity and say who lacks the knowledge, capacity, and opportunities to take short-term measures to limit impacts, who is least able to cope, 
and who is least able to avoid the impacts. This is another link with migration. Sometimes we think about climate refugees, but it's also worth thinking those who are most in trouble may be those who don't have the resources to move. Migration takes resources, and displacement is what we have to particularly worry about. So what are we trying to do with this agenda? Bridge the social and physical perspectives on adaptation. Try to balance so that we have this end in mind of people's quality of life, their security, both people now, people in the future, urban residents now and urban residents in the future. To push the time horizon. One of the benefits of population, a population perspective is we can bring projections to bear which means having a good sense of what the nature and composition and size of the population will be in the decades to come as climate change impacts begin to unfold in a, in a much more uh, frequent, common, and understood and recognized way. And then, of course, to move this agenda from responding, from even short-term risk reduction efforts, to build in the broader development approach. So I'd like to end by just inviting you to continue this agenda with us on our web platform. This is, we've called it Pop Climate, www.popclimate.net. It's a, uh, you can uh, generate a user profile. Uh, it's a community to uh, develop some of the kinds of work and case studies, methodologies, visualizations that are being generated around this agenda. Uh, together with people around the world, with climate practitioners, policymakers, with data specialists, with academics, in a, in a setting that can make this uh, more accessible. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions and to the other presentations. Thanks very much, Daniel, for that really extensive, comprehensive overview of the topics that we're exploring today. I'm particularly intrigued about this distinction between indirect and direct adaptation. I hope we might be able to get into that in the discussion later today. And um, certainly, um, the idea of bridging the social and physical is an area I think that a lot of us in this room are involved in. I'll look forward to that aspect of the discussion as well. And without further ado, I think we'll turn it over to Jose Miguel. Thank you very much to all of you for being here with us. Uh, for us, uh, Daniel, Sainan, myself, this is an excellent opportunity to share what we have done. Uh, and, and also to what we are planning to do, what we are doing now. Um, the title of this presentation is uh, uh, the use of census and survey to surveys uh, to plan for adaptation to climate change. So we are going a little bit more concrete and then Sainan will finish with still more concrete uh, um, work. Uh, the, in terms of the publication, I'm going to concentrate in basically in two um, <coughs> chapters of this book. The main one is uh, understanding vulnerability and adaptation using census data. Uh, it has been written by uh, Daniel Sainan and, and myself. And the second one on using household surveys in climate vulnerability and adaptation analysis from <coughs> Landy Sanchez Peña and Regina Fuchs. Um, well, when the objective of the publication presented here was uh, to help in what we call putting population in the adaptation to climate change maps. We, start from, we started from the idea that population related uh, data from census, surveys and other administra administrative data can and must be used for adaptation to climate change. And the best way to do it is by linking this information to environmental data in a practical and effective way. We consider that by doing this, we will introduce to climate change discussion one of the most important dimensions of adaptation, which is the adaptation of individuals and households to the effect of climate change. However, in spite of the importance of putting people on adaptation maps, the use of population dynamics data for climate change adaptation is uh, still uh, rather limited. <coughs> uh, 
And this is an important area of research and practical work that can help to connect the dots between individual and community adaptation, between demography and geography, and between environment, environment and population dynamics. Uh, sorry. There is no doubt uh, that census and household surveys data are excellent sources of good and quality data for climate change adaptation. But in order to exploit their potential, we need to be able to, first, to define a framework that better link uh, the population to adaptation, as, uh, as uh, Daniel has presented in, his in the previous presentation. This framework must allow for the selection of key indicators establishing their specific relevance for adaptation programs and their level of at the level of disaggregation required. There is so much data available that just a computation of indicators on everything e is existing in census database is not very useful. And we have seen some examples of calculation of aggregate indices that in some cases doesn't reflect any specific area of concern uh, and mix many things at the same time. Uh, also, we need to be able to uh, have access to the data in a way that make possible, best possible to link population data to environmental information. This requires open access to the georeference and ge disaggregated population databases, which is in many countries very difficult uh, for different reasons. In some cases, the argument of uh, the confidentiality becomes a very important issue, but I think in most cases it's, it's more than that, and we need to break this, really, this barrier. I in some cases, even the information is available but the level of disaggregation uh, that we get from the statistical offices, for example, is not the adequate the one that for, for us to do the analysis. So in some way, what we propose here is we need to create, uh, reprocess, rearrange existing individual and household data to map and analyze the differential vulnerabilities and adaptive capacities to climate change impacts. This requires, obviously, the development of national expertise, training, and a lot of knowledge transfer. What is this framework that we are talking about? Well, we just uh, we are trying just to identify some, at least two issues that we think are relevant in the discussion of this framework to, for understanding the effect of climate change and responding to them. Um, first, we think that there exists different levels or layers for vulnerability and adaptive capacities that go from the individual to the household, to the communities, to the cities, to the countries. And at each level, the challenge to be faced, the indicators to be defined, and the data to be collected and used are different and require different approaches for their analysis. A starting from the bottom means that individual and households are at the center and their needs are defined at the starting point of the process of planning for adaptation. In some ways, the adaptation research and policy advice has been more extensive on the ability to adapt of different systems, as Daniel has mentioned, particularly at the community and city levels, and less in terms of the individual and household adaptation. Uh, for example, there has been an increased interest in community adaptation, where qualitative studies uh, have been used to define priorities, needs, and, opportuni and opportunities. While this approach is very relevant it needs to be complemented by a more integrated and multi-level approach. At each level, the type of indicator, the context and focus, as well as the way we analyze them are specific. Census and survey data provide information to generate, to generating data on characteristics associated with the vulnerability or with the capacity to adapt and build resilience of individuals and households. Obviously, aggregated indicators can be built for the upper levels based on the information on the bottom. But other information specific to these levels must be also generated. For example, information on effect of disaster at the level of communities, block of enumeration areas. We have at least two cases of census in Latin America that include some question of environmental effects at the level of the enumeration area. It is important to underline that from the bottom to the upper levels, we go from the individual and household decision-making process to a more political and institutional decision-making process. We go from people to systems, and this distinction is relevant when defining relevant indi the, the, the indicators. 
In terms of analyzing adaptation, both approaches complement each other. Unfortunately, the frequent focus, the frequent focus on physical adaptation over sociodemographic um, um, make that, uh, and, and that most adaptation efforts concentrate on national, municipal, municipal and to some extent community levels, and very few look at the individual and household level. The second element to be considered is what we, uh, what we call uh, that when we try to analyze different indicators, we, we, we realize that there are two kind of indicators. One that we call common climate vulnerability indicators that we define on the base of those factors of character or characteristics that affect the capacity to adapt independently of the kind of hazard. Being poor, for example, is one of these factors. At the same time, there are what we call the hazard-specific indicators associated with different kind of hazards. For example, living in a house with air conditioning is very important if we talk about heat wave, but it's irrelevant in case of flooding. In each of these levels, we usually define both, both type of indicators. So working on adaptation means that we consider that there is not competition but complementarity in working at the different levels. Finally, we need to consider that with demographic change, each of these levels become a, moving, a rapid moving target, as Daniel has mentioned before. For example, individuals and households selectively, selectively move to the cities or migrate to other areas. And we know that avail avail availability of resources is one of these factors that allow people to move. The size, type, and a structure of communities and cities change rapidly when there is a, urban a rapid urban population growth, let's say of 5% or higher, as in many African cities today. For this reason, in this book, this main perspective is that m rapid urbanization and high population growth generate dynamic processes that need to be considered in planning for adaptation. Considering cities and communities as close entities is not an option. And this, uh, this kind of uh, um, dynamic process uh, need to be considered in each of these layers of le or levels. Our main point here is that census and survey data, which are in most cases underutilized under for climate change analysis, can be used to calculate indicators for each of these layers, starting in the lower layers. In the publication, we propose to divide indicators, both common and specific, in three types, demographic, human and social capital, built environment. The census provide data on all these three components, and on those issues is the only source with comp comprehensive data available for a small area. Another way to see, uh, to present this same analysis, is what uh, Sanchez and Fuchs in the article has uh, included, in which they define the area in which the information from census and survey, the population-related data, become more relevant, particularly in the area of exp exposure, as the information allows for the identification of where the population lives and the characteristic of some characteristic of this population, but also in the era in the in the component of sensitivity as information uh, as age, sex, household structure, and other allows for the identification of the characteristics that in some cases can generate vulnerability. And finally, in the adaptive capacity that include those elements of social and human capital that are relevant as part of the individual and household assets in dealing with different hazards. We show here some examples. I'm not going to, to discuss those in details, but in the book and uh, the article, we present different uh, examples of the indicators. We don't, have a comp we don't pretend to have a comprehensive list, and we are not selecting from there which are the most relevant, just to provide an idea that the kind of work that can be done when we work uh, uh, on, on this kind of, um, yeah. Regarding survey data, because most of my, my, my previous uh, comments were related to census data. Um, I want to refer to one of the more comprehensive survey programs on health and population issues, the demographic and health surveys. Um, at IC ICF International, the DHS program is considered as providing an excellent opportunity to link population to health data uh, uh, to climate change analysis. On the, the climate change resilient development uh, group, there is an interest in the potential use of DHS for climate change studies. 
And actually, there are already many, many research, uh, many studies that, are being, that have been conducted using DHS data. New ideas are being developed in order to increase the synergies between the work being done on DHS and the work doing in the area of climate resilient development. And there are mainly three areas. One of the use of DHS to develop climate change related indicators and indices, the use in the same way we have been using, we have been mentioning for the census, including a composite uh, resilient index as shown in figure one. And uh, this is uh, that present a uh, composite index for uh, using uh, information from DHS for the case of Malawi. Okay. Um, the second point, the second element is the use of DHS to understand vulnerability to climate-related health that focus on research on linkages between both issues. And finally, supporting the planning, monitoring, and evaluation of climate change adaptation and integrated uh, programming. We also understand that this process required to enhance DHS and other household survey to better inform climate resilient development. What does this mean? And I think this is very important in terms of the, the way forward. It means that we have ver very possibilities, one, many possibilities. One of them is to add to, f to the selective addition of questions. For example, by introducing a specific question, are we changing categories of already existing questions? And this is applied for DHS, but also for many other household sur surveys that countries are, are introducing, developing. It can be also considered, we can also consider the possibility to developing a specific climate change modules that can be added to the existing surveys. It also means developing an application we questionnaire for the upper levels. Uh, Another way is to another um, is to oversample some areas. If we if we think that there are some areas in which, for some reason, they are more affected by environmental hazards, this could be an, a, a way to bring this this issue with more clarity. If we oversample these these areas, and finally, as the information from surveys is limited in terms of geographic coverage, linking data from survey to a more detailed data from census is a very practical and effective way to get the best of both worlds. And I think this is relevant because in many countries they have been used this strategy for building the poverty map, for example, we using household income surveys and census data. Uh, as I don't have more time, I want to concentrate now in, in, in the final comments and what are the challenges and the way forward. I think in conclusion, census and household survey data are incredible sources of good, adequate data to face the challenges of building indicators to map adaptation, vulnerability, and adaptive capacities. They are available, but in order to use them effectively for planning for adaptation and building resilient communities, cities, and countries, we need first to identify and define which are the best indicators and know how we can use them in a consistent framework. Second, decide what other information is needed and how this information could be collected. Uh, for example, more climate variables and impacts on household welfare must be included in household surveys. Promote more open access to disaggregate data. Increase the links between population-related information and remote sensing information. And develop better concept conceptual links, which will help to increase the institutional links between the statistical office and ministry of environment, for example. It is, it is uh, incredible uh, when you visit many countries how disconnected are those, those institutions. They work with different kind of uh, maps and, and information. It's not linked. And so uh, Ministry of Environment work more in terms of the areas could be affected, but without linking to the population that is something that comes from uh, data that usually statistical offices have. There seems no doubt that by providing the foundation of a more dynamic and human-centered approach to adaptation to climate change, population data will contribute to the development of a more compre comprehensive and effective adaptation plans and program for a perspective that put individual at the center of development. Um, and I want to say that uh, the 2010 route of census that cover more of 90% of the world population is an incredible amount of uh, data available. The same applies to DHS and other household surveys that have consistent and comparable data. 
probably we don't need new, new huge data collection exercises. Let's use what is available and let's complement that with new data and maybe new complementary ways to get, to get data that is not yet, yet available. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose Miguel. Um, it's fascinating to see ideas related to a, a new framework that could help us better link population and adaptation. Um, I'm particularly excited to see the developments at the demographic and health surveys to uh, ideas around better integrating um, household surveys that could help us better understand resilience at the household level. I would, I would love to talk about that more if we have a chance in the, in the discussion period. I'm also really interested in, you, you highlighted the questions uh, about access to data, that even when we have good data, how do, how do practitioners and other stakeholders access that data? And that was certainly a big issue uh, when I was in the Dominican Republic last week at the seminar, uh, talking with government officials and others who are implementing and planning for adaptation. How do they actually access the relevant uh, demographic data? And not only the question of access, but having the level of expertise and the training to know how to use it. Uh, these are questions that I think are, are really um, worth exploring, too, if we have a chance in the discussion period. Uh, we'll turn it over now to Sanan. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here sharing uh, with you the two of our empirical studies of how to apply census data into vulnerability analysis and uh, on climate change adaptation. So here again is a framework uh, of methodology how I, uh, we are applied in the case study. So I have indicators um, from census data individual and household level and we have common indicators and the hazard specific indicators. So I'm going to start with Malawi case study, uh, introducing some of the indicators we used in the case study. First, common uh, indicators. Now I'm going to uh, switch to Malawi and the GIS interface. So here's a country, and the shaded area is the selected five cities, and we uh, and I'm going to use my, the capital Lilongwe as an example. So here the first indicator on um, the very basic is population density. Here is a boundary, and we can see the huge contrast uh, within and outside the boundary the population density is. And the other next indicator is the age structure. So for example, here is the proportion of age um, 10 to 24 young people. They are located in the urban center. And uh, the old people um, aged uh, 60 and above, most of them are found outside urban boundary. And uh, another indicator we used is uh, um, population by uh, each, each bedroom. And the school attendance, for example, the dark area is a proportion of population who only attended a primary school. So they most live in rural area, and uh, for most people complete their secondary school, so they live in urban center. So what I just talked about is individual um, indicators. Now when we switch to housing indicators, I just give one example of STI, Secure Tenure Index to implying the, um, social, uh, the economic status of household. So the higher the value means they potentially have a, a higher economic status of the household. So most of them are in urban center. Um, OK, so for hazardous specific indicators, when we're thinking about flooding, so we have, for example, 
occupation of non-agriculture or agriculture and a grass roof. And uh, next, uh, access to piped water. And uh, whether the household have a radio to get the information of early warning. So these are examples. So how to measure vulnerability? Oh, yeah, sorry. So the reason I use um, GIS interface is because we can um, provide interactive information of how we process the data and indicators. For example, if I click here, each um, unit, we can see all the indicator popped up. So when we click each one, we have all the information here. And we can also overlay with the, the aerial photo to check the ground truth. For example, here is the urban center. We can see the building housing uh, conditions there. So most of them uh, have brick walls and concrete uh, roof. But if we switch to rural area, here, let's see here. And when we amplify this vintage, so obviously most of them have the grass roof and the earth floor. And also we can use 3D to present the population density. The different color ramp is to contract, uh, contrast within an outside urban area. So we can easily um, to say from different angles and play around. OK, also we can combine two indicators. For example, uh, the color presents the proportion of household with earth floor, and the height presents the population density. OK, so after all these variables are available and ready, so how to link to the um, exposure, risk exposure, to mirror the vulnerability Le uh, level. So for our case study in Malawi, it's a country lack of environmental data. So I tentatively use remote sensing images, elevation, and the precipitation, and river as stream um, to proceed hydro uh, hydrologic analysis and the mapping the potential flood risk. So I assign each unit with the risk rank. And uh, so here, this picture is a process of hydrological analysis. And this picture is the results of the risk level. So we link the risk level to the indicators we just uh, introduced. So for each risk level, we can have a closer look at their population structure and housing conditions. So by this way, we all know where in the high risk area, how, who lives there, and what their um, the information of all the from the census data. So the next example I'm gonna to give is to Indonesia case study. And uh, again we use a flat risk. So now we come to the study area of Indonesia. Uh, this is study area of Simaran city and the district. And again, um, here we focus on the low elevation coastal zone. So I'm gonna to zoom in. This is a flood uh, risk data provided from the government and uh, the National Agency of uh, Disaster Management. So it is a raster data. If you click on each pixel, it pop out with the risk value 0 0.6. If you click the dark area, 0 0.8. So it's ranked from, uh, range from zero to one, indicating the risk level. Using this information, we get the, for each vintage, so this is vintage boundary of the flood risk from low to high. And then we focus on the middle to high level um, risk that the vintage is exposed to. So here, this area, the pattern with blue dots, uh, Middle risk, this uh, middle to high risk, and two vintages are exposed to, to the highest uh, flooding risk. 
So we overlay the risk information with with the um, vulnerability indicators. Here is the population density. This is the city center with high population density. And uh, again, we can look at the age structure. Uh, unlike Liangwe city in Malawi, so here young people are most uh, outside urban, and inside urban are most uh, elder people. So similarly, we can do all the rest uh, indicators. So we can click them to check all the indicators. So we go through the vulnerability indicators. So how to identify the most vulnerable villages combine all the indicators. So this is the next challenge we have. So we selected the three basic, most straightforward and comprehensive uh, index. The first, population density. Second, uh, dependency ratio, including they provide the age uh, structure information. And third is security tenure index as a representative of housing conditions. So we combine the information and uh, we get the results of the most vulnerable villages using quantile. So for example, the 25 percentage of villages with the highest uh, population density like that. So the results is the map. Um, here I opened the legend. So you can say all the colors, they indicate they are vulnerable, uh, identified by which indicator or identified one of the three, or maybe more than one. So after we identify the most vulnerable villages, the next step is how to link policy to make them relevant to policy, policy for adaptation planning. So for this purpose, we provide a full profile for all these uh, most vulnerable villages. For example, we're back to this picture and uh, these two villages, let me highlight it with the red boundary. So these two are already been involved by the uh, Indonesia government involved in the uh, great effort of adaptation planning. So they identified in our study as um, vulnerable because of low STI. But what are their differences? So when we looked into other indicators, for example, this tea village, it is lack of access to piped water compared to M village. And then when we look at lack of access to a phone, the M village, most of the households, they don't have a cell phone or fixed phone. So by this way, we unfold all the information to provide, uh, for example, comparing these two villages the information of the risk they're facing, their population indicators, and all the household indicators. So in this case, the population structure is pretty similar for these two villages. But when we look at the household indicators, there are huge differences. For example, the access to the um, piped water and uh, uh, access to the phone or internet, so they present differences. So by this way, we can provide looking at uh, uh, each village from different angles. OK, next step, uh, what we can do is to, like Jose Miguel said, we can link the census data and the variables to um, points data, like DHS data or infrastructure data. So here, an example, we overlay the population density with the location of a hospital. So here, an example, we calculate in each risk level how many hospitals there, but we can also use spatial analysis to, uh, to test uh, the, for example, the center of the village to the distance of the center of the village to the hospital. Uh, and uh, their service boundary, and uh, uh, also the, the size they can, uh, they can uh, service to the, the patients. So another example is the distribution of schools. So many information can be 
get from the analysis uh, when linking all these uh, infrastructure data and the census data. And in future, potentially, the DHS data. Um, so this is pretty covered what we are doing now. Um, from the book, uh, if we are interested in look at other chapters, um, they have other uh, climate change related risk. For example, in chapter nine, uh, they talked about the vulnerability analysis in facing a landslide and uh, heat waves. So I'd like to um, close my presentation by borrowing one slide from Daniel. Uh, we structured our output of case study in a way of informa uh, informative and relevant to policymakers by not only look at what is vulnerable, but also who is most vulnerable and why they are identified as vulnerable and what they need, how to change. And all this will provide valuable information to policymakers when considering a more resilient, better urban future. So thanks. Thank you very much, Sainan. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm, I'm fascinated to see the way these layers of data can be overlaid with each other and thinking about what that might mean for policymakers and program managers who are trying to devise strategies for reducing vulnerability. It's really exciting to see the way that these layers can come together and the various combinations that we might want to look at that would help us better understand how to reduce vulnerability. With that, I, I'm, I'm really pleased that we have about 20 minutes to engage in discussion with those of you here in the room and also with our colleagues, the journalist colleagues from the Society of Environmental Journalists who are tuning in from Chattanooga. And who is it who is um, feeding their questions to us via Twitter, if you could raise your hand? Okay, great. Um, well, why don't we kick it off with a couple of questions from here in the room. We'll pull together a couple of questions and then ask the panel to respond. So why don't we take two questions in from in the room and then if we have one uh, coming in from uh, Chattanooga, that would be great. Um, why don't we start right back here, if we could. And uh, just a reminder to please say your name and your affiliation before you ask your question. Hi, I'm Tina Carsberg. I'm with the Department of Energy, and I guess I, I couldn't help noticing how uh, most of the speakers talked about how in this area, at least in the IPCC reports, there had been somewhat of a overfocus on physical infrastructure uh, as opposed to what do you guys call it? PE, whatever pop the the things that y'all been talking about today. But what I kind of wonder is. Um, I mean, you, you can't, you have to kind of talk about both, don't you? I mean, there was an article out front saying about all the health and environmental benefits if everyone or if 500 people switched to riding bikes around or if 20% of people did this. I, I don't remember what the number was, but it was pretty impressive. And somehow it seems to me that if a whole lot of people started doing things with bikes, it would might have a physical imp infrastructure impact. So I just wanted to know if, the, if it, they could all talk about you know, some of the linkages with the physical infrastructure, which, you know, does change over time, so. Patricia Fagan, Georgetown University. I'm very impressed by these presentations and I think they're innovative and, and suggest many exciting lines of research for people who are interested both in climate change and in urbanization. And I very much like the idea that urbanization is the process, not just cities as a, as a thing um, that's static. And for that reason, I want to ask in particular about um, the you, uh, Daniel used the term unplanned settlements, and I like that. I like the term better than periurban, better than a lot of other terms that have been used, because they are indeed unplanned settlements. Uh, settlements in places where settlements weren't planned for, and where governments typically don't want there to be settlements, or often don't want there to be settlements, and where, as I think all of you mentioned, people are more mobile than in other places. So my question is really a methodological one. 
how much of it, the research challenge of gathering data and devising indicators in this particular context, which is so difficult. Do you ask different questions? Do the household surveys, uh, are they particularly useful as opposed to some of the other kinds of methodologies? It's really the methodological question of how to do research in these very difficult environments. Thank you. Do we have a question from Chattanooga? Hi, we do. We have um, we have two. I can just give one though. Um, the one is from a freelance journalist, Lisa Palmer. Um, her question is: um, Estimates indicate that 32 million people were displaced by disasters in 2012, twice as many as the previous year. How can disaster prevention and preparedness reduce disaster losses before becoming a crisis concern, especially as population increases? Okay, thank you for that set of question. I, I, I know that there are a lot of hands yet, but why don't we give a chance for our panelists to address these first three questions. Who would like to take the question from um, relating about connecting the physical and the social responses? Dan? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks for all of these questions. I, I look forward to more as well. Um, so I, I think it's very important to say that this is intended to be a complementary approach to existing adaptation options. Um, we don't pretend to have full and complete information on vulnerability, on the nature of people's lives, uh, on their community interactions, on the nature of the social system, the physical systems in place. But what we have is vital and entirely missing information when you look at existing on the ground adaptation programs at various levels. Um, so I, I would not uh, discount in any way the physical approach to vulnerability or adaptation, but simply to say that when we bring this to a vast array of existing adaptations on the ground, community-based, qualitative, policy-oriented, systems-oriented, that we're filling a gap, I think, in information. And not only that, but this is information, as Holmes and Miguel said, that is ve available for most of the world's population in high degrees of detail um, and high resolution. So uh, in that sense, just think of it in that way. Think of this as arriving into an existing policy framework, development framework, and adaptation framework, and providing a, a new way of looking at people's vulnerability and resilience. Yes, I would like to add something to this. Uh, I think that what Daniel said is, uh, is the, the way we think about this issue, but I, I would like to add another dimension to this uh, uh, physical environment. It's about transportation. Uh, I was recently in, in, in Kinshasa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I realized uh, how big that city is, in, not just in terms of population, because in terms of population, we don't know exactly how much, many people there are, but it could be seven, eight people, eight millions. But I was in, incredibly impacted by the size of the territory covered by that city, and the distance that people have to move with very, very bad transportation systems. And I was there to say, what does that mean, adaptation here in the city? When people, it takes like two hours for people to get their job. Poor people, really, the one of the most important problems there is transportation. Arrive to their jobs. Actually, they, the salary, uh, in addition to the salary, they pay for transportation, a separate component of the salary of the workers. But it doesn't cover the time that people spend. And I think in terms of disaster and how to adapt in a situation with people uh, have to move very, very long distances. So I think in addition to the f physical environment in terms of uh, built environment, I think it's important to consider also to add this dimension. And I think we have not talked too much about that in the book, but I think it's something that maybe should be one of the challenge. And in terms of the, the, the question on the on the methodolog methodolog methodological issues re in relation to unplanned settlements, I think this is this is a factor. We are saying here we need to consider the dynamic process, but how to do that uh, in terms of data collection? We have census every 10 years. Uh, uh, we have surveys every five years, DHS in many sub-Saharan African countries, uh, you know. Um, but uh, we, it's not so easy to follow the di dynamic process. And I think this is something which we need to work with different, maybe in a different strategies. 
because I think the, the good news is from the census, we, we cover every, the, we are supposed to cover the whole territory, so we will be covering also the unplanned settlement. Everybody will be enumerated in a, should be enumerated in a census. So in, so, so in this way, we got information from this area. In the surveys, we can oversampling those areas if we think that it will be useful to understand better the dynamics uh, process of linkages between population and environment in those areas. But to really get the, the changing process, uh, I think there is still many methodological and practical challenges. And actually, let me just jump in on that one too. Uh, uh, it's, it's complicated to uh, count in certain areas, and many people don't necessarily want to be counted. Am I, um, when I was in, uh, uh, yes, yeah. I'll get to that one as well. When I was in, um, I, I did my uh, dissertation research in uh, Durban, South Africa, and uh, Cato Manor, a central city uh, informal settlement, was well known to have a population of over 100,000, and in the census had a population of about 10,000. Um, so we had a lot of interesting information, but of course uh, it, it, it wasn't representative. The interesting thing about a spatial framework is that we can start to layer in other sources of information. If we have, you know, in the case of South Africa, cell phone information on density. If we have local enumerations conducted by Slum Dwellers International and other kinds of, uh, we, those things can be folded in and we can do complementary uh, and layered information like that. I do want to get quickly to uh, Lisa Palmer's excellent question about displacement. One thing to be careful about, just to say quickly, is to compare displacement from natural disasters year to year, uh, because it depends very heavily on what kind of events happened in the world last year. Were there floods in Pakistan? Were there, was there a, a, a hurricane in Louisiana? Um, so, but the, the key, I think, it, it nonetheless is a vital question. It's the difference, I think, between displacement and, let's say, migration. So who is able to move in advance of events? Who is able to have the resources to leave and trust that they can come back? Um, most migration from, uh, related to natural disasters is short-term and local. Um, and so really shifting that dimension to support internal mobility, to support international mobility, um, and to support networks and uh, links between migrants and uh, their families where they left, you know, and communities that they left, is really critical to sort of getting people, getting to people before they are displaced. And I think it's a very good question. Did you okay. Great. Anything else to add on that first set of questions? All right, we'll, we'll move on to another round of questions. Why don't we take one here? And here, I know you've had your hand up for a while, sir. And then we'll take one here. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And thank you all again for um, the presentations. And again, really, really interesting information in here. Um, I'm Alice Thomas. I'm with the Climate, Climate Displacement Program at Refugees International. Um, as the book points out, I just did a quick read through on some of it, so um, I haven't had a chance to read it all yet. But um, as the book points out, and, and we have um, seen in our own research in uh, countries in the Sahel and Niger and Burkina, um, migration becomes a main coping strategy for the poorest households. Um, but it, as the book points out, it doesn't always decrease vulnerability. It can decrease vulnerability and promote resilience, but it can also increase vulnerability. Um, but the problem is constantly that there's no recognition of what's the difference between just a normal economic migrant and somebody who's maybe moving because of climate change. So should adaptation strategies include um, specific protection frameworks for people who are um, climate migrants, let's call them, um, or are existing uh, migration arrangements and you know what 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 there is out there is that sufficient to protect people um, and do you see an important difference between these two phenomena? Hello, uh, my name is Pablo Rodas from the Inter American Development Bank. I came a bit late, but uh, I was listening to you and uh, checking, uh, looking at the book. I see that you talk a lot about this migration from, from the rural to the, to the urban places. 
Uh, however, the kind of migration that you had in the last 20 years, let's say, in the, in the war in developing and, and, and emerging countries, is quite different to the urbanization that you had in the 50s, 60s, or 70s. Before it was these macro cities like Mexico, or Sao Paulo, or Delhi, uh, and many others, uh, Peking. But now the kind of migration in the last 20 years is mainly to secondary cities. Even macro cities like Mexico, they have, has, uh, they, they have reduced population. Then the difference is very important regarding with climate change and adaptation, because usually in these middle-sized cities, like Monterrey, for instance, uh, they are more environmentally uh, protected because you don't have too much problems of transport, you don't have uh, many of these slums that uh, appear in the macro cities. Uh, and this has to do with the economic model that was uh, uh, in place before and now, because before it was more a kind of import substitution model, the factories needed to be close to the to the consumers, to the to, to the cities, and now it's more kind of export-led growth. They need to be closer to the to the ports, to the airports, to, to the roads, and then it doesn't matter too much to be very close to the large city. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if you tackle this issue in the book uh, or if this is for for the research in your case. Thank you. Let's take one more here. Uh, James Stang, this is related to your comment about Kinshasa and transportation. Traditionally, when you have displacements or migrations, quite often it's not because the houses are flooded, but because the fields are flooded, i.e. people can't make a living. They can still live there. Uh, do you have a way of, can you look at the commercial databases and stuff like that to look at the uh, impact on um, making a living in the context of climate change? Okay, and is there another question we could take from Chattanooga? There's a general question from the group over there, which is um, people are asking for tips on how to make these big, complex issues approachable for a newspaper audience or for an online audience. Um, what are the possible entry points for journalists trying to commute some communicate something this complex? Mm -hmm. uh, that is an excellent question. Th that's a really good point, Sandeep. Thank you. I, I think all of you know that our journalists need to leave us uh, right at 1.30, so we'll take that question first. And I think that we have permission from the Wilson Center to stick around past our 1.30 end time for those of you here in the room who would like to continue the conversation. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and take that question from Chattanooga first. Uh, entry points for making these complex issues more understandable um, and reportable. Uh, any ideas from the panel? Uh, sure. I, I, I don't take our <laughs> hesitance as signs that there aren't. In <laughs> fact, there are. One, one particularly good approach, I think, journalists often take an individually oriented perspective, an uh, individual's households, individual impacts. Um, that's a very good entry point, and, and we are providing data at that level. Um, now, and so you can always situate people in communities and situate them in their uh, cities, but you need to talk about those people. And I think that's really part of what this work is about. And the second piece is, you know, maybe at a little, a little further beyond the process than we've necessarily been able to show today, but you've got to find a way to show information in an accessible way. And, um, you know, as, as Sinan was able to show some of the more complete, not necessarily the live look at the uh, maps, but the completed maps with the legends and the information. I can promise you that uh, every, anytime we look at the New York Times and these interactive map systems, you show that instead of showing tables about, you know, household characteristics and vulnerability or uh, other kinds of information displays. You show that and people will pay attention, I think, in a m and because they understand it in a much more accessible way. Can Daniel, I could, I, if I could just have a quick follow-up on that. It, if people wanted to access the kind of visual data that was presented here today. Is there a way of doing that now? Is that publicly accessible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so we have the public climate um, platform. So we are gradually upload our case study methodology and the, the theory framework there. And also uh, in future, we will also uh, embed uh, an data analysis tool. So allow the users to upload their own data and to calculate. Okay, so that's available on the popclimate.net site that was 
that Daniel, Daniel showed Daniel earlier. Provided. Which also Thank really you. invites uh, people to upload their own work in addition and exchange and share. Exciting, that's great. I, I would like to add something about the, the, you know, the entry point for journalists. I think I want to mention three things. One is what Daniel was saying. I think it's about po people's life. It's about it, uh, climate change hazards can impact many people in different ways. We need to be able to tell people because you, if you are another person, I, I, there is a heat wave. There, there, there is the kind of measure that you can take to give you a very concrete example. Um, the second component is that uh, journalists like uh, figures uh, in terms of not a lot of one, but just one, 30 millions, 150 millions. This kind of figure has been used, for example, to measure the impact of migration, the number of migrants that will be impacted. And I think this kind of analysis can provide that because after doing all this detailed analysis, we need to provide some figures, some summary of how many people will be affected in Santo Domingo or in Malawi, in Lilongwe or in, in Semara uh, because of these uh, flooding areas? How, how many people will be affected in the future? I think this is a, a, third compo a second component that we could be a very important entry point. And the third one is about uh, new ways to show information. Um, Sainan showed this 3D mapping but actually, this is just the beginning of something that could be more more sophisticated, but also more easy for people to understand. What we had in mind when we started working on that is to be able to map, to develop applications in which people can, what we call, navigate on the, uh, over the surface of inequalities, over the surface of vulnerability, in which you can see what happens if you change some parameters, how this surface will change. And I think this is more powerful than anything we can show in terms of uh, papers, written, uh, things like that. I think we need a little bit more than that. Actually, we wanted to bring a 3B map in only long way with some uh, vulnerability index. Uh, you know, something you can put there, if people can see and touch. We were not able because some technical oh. reasons, but I think the, also this is another way to show to, to people. I, and I think there are many other opportunities and we can discuss uh, with more details after this, this meeting. Uh, there, there was another question, or you wanted to say something on that? Just to add a little bit uh, uh, additional information about migrant, migrant people. So it is a huge group of population. So I personally feel that it will be very interesting to look into this group. And so they might uh, exaggerate or reduce the vulnerability. And uh, whether they, they migrate for which reasons, for climate reasons or economic reasons. So I think that's... Uh, it's already be one of the indicators, but I think uh, that will be, yeah, we need to also touch the importance on that. And uh, the other is, um, in my presentation, I uh, stressed a lot about data visualization and analysis. So spatial analysis, not only, uh, it provide a good tool for data visualization, for mapping, but the most important is allow us to link all the different data together to link the census data, the environmental data, the infrastructure, the points, or remote sensing, so we can get all the information. And so that's, um, I think, uh, uh, in the future of analysis, we will also incorporate like land use land cover and to, uh, from the remote sensing to detect the drought. And especially, for example, in our case study in Malawi, they don't have environmental data, so it can allow us to link the uh, to make the, uh, the environmental risk from those uh, surface index sending into census data. Sanon, would there be ways, have you seen evidence of um, uh, d layers of data that would include livelihood strategies in that? I think that might help uh, get to the, the question asked by James, sort of understanding better how we can use this data to uh, dig a little more deeply into livelihood strategies that may be at risk because of climate change. Um, yeah, I uh, agree. So um, <laughs> I think so. So there is this special, special analysis like livelihood analysis or like all spatial correlation. Um, so this all can be used for environmental analysis and uh, Maybe yeah. also just to say, the census has information on occupation and employment. It's not perfect information, but it can tell you who's farming. 
uh, who's in agriculture, where they live, and we can use land use land cover data to identify where farming is occurring, and we can use flood risk data and even remote observation of flooding to identify fields that may be impacted. Now there's an ecological fallacy, you can't always say who, which particular farmer is impacted by which particular flood. Um, but this is the only way to put all of that together in a meaningful way. Uh, and it's all, much of it is either available nationally via the census or, or internationally and globally via a, a wide array of remotely sensed information. Um, so I, I think there's opportunity there. Um, there were also two questions about migration. Maybe should we? I, we should move to those, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, do, do you want to, should I? Um, just to say, I think, I think the, the line, there, there is no line, I think, we've now established between environment and climate, or in economic and, and climate or environmental migration. Uh, environmental migration is as old as migration, which is as old as labor migration. Um, and so, I, but I do think that there's a couple different dimensions of uh, climate migration. The one everyone talks about is impact happens, people move. Um, the one we often like to, the, a lot of the community likes to, um, the migration community likes to talk about is people move to avoid impacts happening, and that's migration is adaptation. And there is a third, which is many people have livelihoods that are based on uh, migration, whether it's uh, following uh, agricultural uh, harvests, whether it's uh, nomadic lifestyles, whether it, you know, temporary and seasonal migration. Um, and those have a certain sensitivity to climate impact. So people's livelihoods can be disrupted, their migration-based livelihoods can be disrupted uh, by changes to the environment. Um, and in that sense, that's, that's kind of a different story, and that's about uh, industrialization, it's about development, it's about finding livelihood alternatives that are less sensitive uh, to climate impacts. Just, just a minor comment I want to add on this, and uh, in terms of, you know, um, how we qualify the, the, the migrants, uh, environmental migrants, has been a very long discussion in terms of classifying as refugees, for example, and then what are the implications of this for in terms of human rights and in terms of the, the, the different convention existing in terms of refugees. And, and I think now, the, as far as I know, uh, I have not been following that closely, but I think uh, there is not, uh, I, at least from the community of people working on migration, there is not, uh, most of them, and the, I don't think they agree with the idea of classifying environmental migrants necessarily as refugees, because this is an, an, a, a different concept. But I think this is still something that uh, will, be, will be, and is being discussed in many areas, in many countries. The Cancun Adaptation Framework negotiated, I believe, you'll pardon me, the cops can run together, but the climate change talks, but um, uh, I think it was uh, the 17th climate change talks. Uh, the, the Cancun Adaptation Framework was the first to explicitly recognize migration uh, as uh, one of the impacts of climate change and to encourage uh, the world to address it in some form, so there is progress on that front. Very short in the issue of urbanization, and I think uh, you were right, uh, urbanization patterns are changing, are different, but I think also it, uh, we need to consider that different regions are in different moments. Latin America has basically completed the uh, urbanization process, most of the country. There are still some countries that are less urbanized, but if you think in terms of many countries of Asia and many countries of Africa, they are still building some kind of mega cities, maybe not in the way that they were uh, in, in the case of, for example, Mexico City or Sao Paulo and other big cities, but you have also in, in those countries. And I think it's important to differentiate, but I think the most important point there is that in many, in many countries, in particular in those countries that are urbanizing now, there is some reluctance to accept urbanization as something that's really happening. And this is the main concern that we have, and it has tremendous implications in terms of policy because there is some kind of, this does not exist. We don't have urbanization. And you see every time, every census, that percentage of people living in urban areas is increasing and increasing. You see cities growing very fast, but there is still some reluctance to accept that. Uh, but I think the, the uh, even with difference from uh, what's happening in Latin America, I think urbanization will be coming in Africa as in Asia quickly. Thank you. And I know that we are over time, but I think that there are still a number of questions
questions that we would like to address, and there's certainly a lot of rich material for us here to investigate. Um, we've received word that our uh, colleagues in Chattanooga at the Society for Environmental Journalists are still online, and they have uh, more questions for us. So let's take one question from Chattanooga, and then I'd like to take two questions from this side of the room, which I feel like we've neglected a little bit. So Chattanooga question first, please. Uh, one question from Chattanooga. This is from reporter Emily Geertz. Do you think that photo or video reporting helps or hurts people's comprehension of these issues? Why don't we go ahead and respond to that question because I think our colleagues there may be cut off shortly. Any thoughts on that, that question? Well, it's, it's a really an interesting one. I, you know, climate change, is, it's, it's sort of systemic, right? And so there's this... You know, I think there's a, a little bit of a nervousness about uh, sort of highly localized uh, sort of narrow perspectives that are very visual. Um, but I think the idea is, if, is there a way to link the photo and the video to the broader context of vulnerability and impacts um, if we're talking about adaptation? Can we situate this in, the, in, a, in a broader context? I think journalists are, are generally very good at using the individual, more localized narrative to tell a larger story. Um, and I think that's also what we and Jose Miguel, when Jose Miguel presented this idea of the layers, it's not to say that the individual experience, this sort of atomistic experience of, of impacts is the most important necessarily, but to say that that is a key component in what needs to be considered. So I think whether it's in providing data at the individual household level or providing you know, photos and videos about the nature and experience of impacts, that, that's vital to get into these more systemic um, and aggregate level approaches to adaptation. Okay, questions here. I think, Jason, you had a question, and why don't we go here as well? I'm Jason Bremner from Population Reference Bureau. Uh, thanks for your presentations today. I have one question on data, but I'll three sub-questions. Uh, <laughs> you should be able to answer them quickly. <laughs> the first is uh, DHS has principally been funded as a health and largely started off as World Fertility Survey, so there's a lot on fertility. And do you think, or are you thinking of how the fertility aspects of DHS play into, um, into your measurement of uh, vulnerability and resilience? Uh, the second is just, are you aware of the TerraPop uh, project that is linking census and remote sensing data out of, it's an NSF project out of University of Minnesota? And then the third is you didn't, and nobody talked about projections. Everything was talking about the census and survey data. And it seems that for adaptation planning, any planning, you need projection data. You need to know where populations are going to be, where they're growing, mm. and how do we incorporate projections into this kind of analysis? That wasn't too long, was it? That's good, good questions. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. here. <coughs> Hi, my name is Denise Ram from the University of Oxford, Future of Cities. My question uh, is in regards to your working in the DRC in um, Malawi, Durban. I'm curious, how responsive are these nations and cities to people who represent the West, who are seen as, you know, the drivers of climate change, the causers? Um, especially when we are saying, you know, climate change is coming, the intensity is going to grow because of what we're doing in the West. You should prepare for this. And we're not really the leaders of showing how to respond to, adap to climate change because look at how, what's happened to us. So who are we to give advice? Thank you for that Good question. question yeah. and I, let's take one final one here. I know you've had your hand up for a while. Take, take the mic, please. Uh, Hugh Haskell from the uh, Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Um, these have all been really good uh, discussions of, of what we are doing, what we can do right now. But it seems to me the elephant in the room that has not been talked about and rarely is talked about is overall population growth. How are we going to deal with two, three, or four billion more people? And if we don't, I think nature's going to do it for us, and we're not going to like the way nature does it. Um, I think, uh, can we deal with 
in the context of what we're what you're all working on, can we deal with this idea of how we're going to deal with with the uh, increasing population, overall population. So everything you're doing is going to be magnified. Thank you for that question. And I think we'll have that be our final set of questions, although I'm going to take the, the moderator's prerogative and, and add, a, ask, add a question of my own, and that is um, maybe a good one for us to conclude with. Yeah. I think one of the conclusions that we can take away from our presentations here today is that incorporating population dynamics will help us strengthen um, adaptation planning and help us better and more effectively reduce vulnerability among people where they are. Um, but there is this question of the accessibility and the utility of the data, getting that into the hands of adaptation policymakers and planners. So I, I hope you could close in your response to these questions by sharing with us some of your ideas w on what the United Nations Population Fund is doing in this realm to help expand through training or learning or data sharing, and as well as if there are initiatives within DHS that is really helping to build the capacity of people and institutions to do this level of analysis as they're developing adaptation plans. So if we could close with that question, I'd appreciate it. Should we start with uh, the elephant? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. Does it well, you decide to start with it. <laughs> well, we we'll get it out of the way. Okay, we'll let's talk out. about it. <laughs> well, you know that uh, in, in, in the first publication that we had on population and climate change, we focused most of the work of was on, on mitigation and linkage, linkages between population from the side of mitigation, and this issue was discussed. And, uh, and uh, in, in relation to the discussion for the Rio conference on sustainable development, um, and for the post-2015 discussion uh, at UNFPA, uh, um, there was a discussion, and or, uh, we organized several meetings uh, on the linkages between population and sustainable development, and one of the main issues was the, the relevance of, of population issues and population growth uh, in terms of both mitigation and adaptation. Uh, we didn't, you are right, we didn't focus too much on that, not because we don't consider that important, because we went basically to this component in which we don't talk in this book too much about population growth. We concentrate maybe about urban growth. And urban growth is uh, the result of urbanization, but also population growth. Uh, and I think, that, but I think this is very relevant. And, and Daniel can mention something about what's happening now in UNFPA. As I'm not there, I cannot talk on behalf of UNFPA, but he can do it. Uh, in terms of the, now that we are going from the, the last question to the first one, in relation to, you know, how this is seen in, in countries, the, the issue of adaptation and, and uh, as perceived as something created by the West. I think we, are, we have seen, I have participated in, in several uh, conference of parties for the uh, uh, climate change uh, talks, and, and, um, and it is clear that every time developing countries are using that as an instrument for leveraging resources in terms of technology uh, transfer, in terms of knowledge transfer, and I think uh, what they are expecting now is that there is a lot of money coming from developed countries to finance adaptation efforts. And one of the reasons is what you said, they don't consider that they create climate change. They are affected, but they didn't, they didn't create it. And I think that in the way that we are able to get resources at the global level to finance uh, all those components, I think uh, the response will be positive because uh, they will be suffering for the impacts uh, of climate change. And helping people to adapt, I think it is a good uh, strategy, not just in terms of social, but also political strategy. Uh, in terms of the question from the colleague from the Population Reference Bureau, yes, uh, you know, in terms of DHS, uh, we are including health question, but you know, now you know that, you know that, I don't know, you know that we are including also biomarkers. We measure malaria, anemia, HIV-8. We test the water, the quality of water in some cases. Uh, in addition, we are incorporating questions uh, on health, reproductive health, family planning, m uh, marriage patterns. I think there are so many questions that are there that goes beyond the, the traditional uh, demographic uh, approach that could be useful. How fertility can be used in this, in this process, I think it, can, it could be used from the perspective of individuals that have to deal with families very, uh, you know, uh, number, um, family with very high number of children in which they have to face the difficulties of, of feeding these, these, uh, these children 
uh, the difficulties for women and, and families to deal with the requirement that those children have in context in which you have, for example, high incidence of malaria. Um, when you see that in many countries the incidence on, in children is higher than 30 percent, you say, you know, how those people deal with this situation when they have seven, or eight, nine children. It's more difficult in terms of everything. So I think there is a way, we cannot discuss this now, but I think there is a way to link that. In terms of the, um, the work on the Minnesota, I don't, I, mean, I don't know if you also refer to the IPUMS uh, project, which they are collecting data for a sample of census, and I think this is a very important initiative um, for most of the country are trying to get a sample of the, uh, the census, and the microdata in such a way that people can use extensively. And I think this is uh, an interest to use in that. Uh, in terms of the final question of projections, uh, you are completely right. Uh, we we had uh, last year a, a meeting when I was in APA to we, in which we bring different researchers and people working on on the issue of, of urbanization and and particularly in the issue of uh, of uh, remote sensing data uh, for for looking at the cities and the city growth. And the proposal it was that we develop uh, strategies and tools to uh, develop new tool, new new methodology for population projection of cities that incorporate not just, incorporate, first, incorporate better the demographic components, but also incorporate other, ele other, uh, other elements. The idea was to develop tools that you can kind of uh, um, develop the different scenarios depending on what could be happening. Uh, and I think this is, uh, uh, there is a lot of interest in many people, in many areas. I know that there is a, a big effort from ESRI, the people that, uh, the owner of this, uh, the RGIS, and based in Singapore, they will be developing also, a, uh, you know, some kind of work in that area. Everywhere, in every center working on urbanization, I think there is an interest to have this in global mapping. The University of Columbia is doing uh, work on that, the University of the City of New York. Um, yeah, there is, but I have to stop there. Okay, I'd just like to second uh, what Jose Miguel said that so we are uh, trying to take effort to linking uh, census data with DHS data. So DHS uh, data is very well organized and structured. Uh, it's provide a lot of evidence on health uh, aspect of uh, the population. So I think uh, such as uh, the fertility uh, you mentioned. Um, if we link this to the, uh, such, for example, the flooding in the Haiti Bay, so I think a lot of, there will be a lot of findings and uh, it will be stronger. Um, and uh, the another is um, the about m projection. So currently we focus on the one year point data, 2008 uh, census data and 2010. And I think it will be very uh, helpful and relevant if we could like check the vulnerability dynamics over time because population is dynamic and also the vulnerability. So if you can uh, monitoring how the vulnerability uh, change over time, you see different series of census data and uh, then project future, then we can provide um, the, uh, the recommendation to policymakers how, like for example, population should migrate, how to relocate them. Um, so that can be the uh, next step. So there are a lot of things that potentially we can do, um, also linked to remote sensing data. Um, so I think that's uh, to incorporate census data and the survey data into the climate change adaptation. It's a uh, way started it, and uh, it has a long way, and it will provide a large range of evidence-based foundation uh, for the policymakers in the future. Okay. Well, th it's, it's the questions have been really excellent. So thank you to that, and uh, maybe if this is towards the last word, thank you again to Kathleen for moderating and to my fellow panelists. Um, so just to touch quickly on each of the points, let's, on population growth, it's, uh, there's, there's population growth coming, there's urbanization coming, and um, urbanization is vital for sustainability, and, in, including in terms of the world providing for the population it has, uh, in terms of economies of scale, in terms of efficiency, in terms of service provision, livelihoods. Um, it's part of the answer, and that's why planning for safe, uh, environmentally secure uh, jobs providing urbanization is so vital and that's what we're, we're, we're trying to contribute maybe that's a little bit of a dodge but I, I, I think it's important um, 
on the the question about the the from the West, um, not to push back a little bit, but but um, we're a diverse panel here, and we also all have represented international institutions, the UN. The UN has a capacity building agenda. It's not about constructing this work ourselves, but about innovating and creating the opportunity for this to be engaged locally. Countries have done their own censuses. The data exist. Certain kinds of capacity exist. And the last thing I'll say after, with, after one or two questions is how we want to help bridge that capacity. And I think that capacity building agenda is part of what makes this much more uh, relevant for countries that we're um, working with. Um, so uh, I guess the last piece, maybe I, I, I'll just say about the accessibility and utility of data. We're very excited um, because on Monday we kick off our project with uh, to work focused most intensively on this capacity gap. Um, we're going to be working with uh, Wolfram Solutions, which is uh, the uh, computing wing of Wolfram Alpha. Many of you, some of you may know this as a uh, sort of the engine behind Siri, for instance. Um, and what they specialize in is taking data and turning it into information, right? There's so much data out there, big data, links, web platforms, databases. But the problem, as Jose Miguel, I think, was saying in his presentation, is not just about the collection of data. It's about doing something with it. And I think with, with regard to spatial data, that's particularly relevant. There's an enormous amount of available spatial data. The problem comes in the capacity to analyze it. Uh, I have my, part of my PhD focus was on uh, s spatial analysis. Sinan is probably one of the world's premier experts on it. Uh, it took us quite some time to uh, generate these kinds of results. And so what we're working on with Wolfram is, the, is, is an online platform to integrate the data in an automated way, read it in, read the metadata, read the different uh, pieces, bring in census, bring in surveys, bring in remote sensing, aerial photography, land use, land cover, all of these things, and to compile, and this is really what they specialize in, compile all of the available algorithms and calculations, indicators that are out there in the literature, and apply them to this collected integrated data on the spatial platform. That's the engine. And then the interface will be this online platform to actually generate and manipulate maps and have the, that generation and manipulation be accompanied by uh, accessible data tables and reports. Um, and so the idea is to sort of bridge this capacity gap through some of this kind of big data analytics technology that exists so that we can say, you've got your data, you've got your climate focus, you have your adapta adaptation planning requirement at local level. Every city in Indonesia has to have an adaptation plan. Here's a tool that allows you to synthesize the data on its own and output it in a way that you can use. And I think that's our most exciting venture to date. We're supposed to have a pilot by the end of the year for both the Indonesia and the Malawi uh, cases. We'll be presenting uh, some of the Indonesia work in, a, in, in the city of Semarang with the mayor next month. And uh, we're very excited about the prospects. The, the thing we need to do, it's going to be folded into Pop Climate, is to try to find a network and a community of people who can help us test this tool, who can see, is this relevant? Is this useful for, you know, your, uh, for a planner, for a practitioner, and help us sort of generate it in a way that's very useful. But we're very excited about it. That is really exciting. Um, we are far <laughs> over time, and I am so pleased that there are still so many people here, but I think we do need to formally close the program at this time. Um, I really want to thank the Wilson Center for hosting this event and to thank our three panelists for sharing such a, a dynamic set of information for us and for all of you for this really useful discussion. And if I could just get, uh, Daniel, for you to say when we wanted to put it back up on the screen, but the website that people could go to 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 access, access this information and also share their own if they have relevant information. If you could um, tell us what that is one more time so we can take that home with us today, that would be great. I'd be happy to. Thanks, Kathleen. It's Pop Climate, www.popclimate.net. 
Um, I, it would be wonderful if you, anyone who's watching, would come, would uh, register if you would like. You can browse the site without registering. But once you register, you can link with, there's a social networking component of it. You can link with different people. You can post your own responses, blogs, comments. You can post case studies, visualizations, methods. And then by the end of this year, you'll be able to interact with this uh, yet to be named, but we'll come up with something fun, um, analytical tool uh, that we're developing.